Happy Thursday, all, and welcome to today's Lightbend webinar for February 8th, titled Streaming Microservices with Aka Streams and Kafka Streams. Today's esteemed presenter is none other, uh, none other than Dr. Dean Wampler, who is our VP of Fast Data Engineering at Lightbend, as well as a multiple uh, book author, speaker, and a pretty darn good amateur photographer as well. While I take a moment to introduce today's session and allow any latecomers out there to get settled, I'd like to ask our audience a quick poll question, and as an incentive to share your experiences, we'll be mailing a Lightbend t-shirt to a randomly selected poll respondent. We're just looking to get a little gauge of what your experience is with Aka Streams and Kafka Streams. So one of the most frequent questions that Dean and I have been asked over and over again uh, throughout the last year or so is, so what's the difference between Aka Streams and Kafka Streams? After all, there really is only a one letter difference between these two technologies, so how different could they be? Well, as we're about to learn, they're actually quite different. Both tools are part of the streaming fast data stack, but were created with entirely different technological approaches in mind. For example, while Aka Streams emerged as a data flow centric abstraction for the Aka, uh, the Aka Actor model, designed for general purpose microservices, low latency event processing, and a wider range of uh, application and integration support through tools like Alpaca, Kafka Streams is purpose-built for reading data from Kafka topics, processing it, and writing the results to new topics in a Kafka-centric way. Now, this description can really only take you so far, however, and that's why we're lucky to have Dean walk us through the topic in a detailed way. So today, Dean will discuss the strengths and weaknesses of Kafka Streams versus Aka Streams for particular design needs in data-centric microservices, He'll follow on by contrasting them with other streaming tools like Apache Spark Streaming and Apache Flink, which provide richer analytics over potentially huge data sets and are also part of Lightbend Fast Data Platform. And ultimately, Dean will help you uh, develop the background you need to map these streaming engines to your specific use cases with a bit of confidence. Today's webinar, which should last approximately 35 to 40 minutes, including Q&A, is made possible only by Lightbend's hundreds of happy customers, especially our client Starbucks, a company that you may have heard of, who built their real-time loyalty reward system with Aka, Scala, and Spark. They're looking for a principal application developer to join their team in Seattle and drink a lot of free coffee while they code. You can find out more about this position and other open positions with our customers and partners on our website under the Company tab. As always, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you next week. If you have questions for Dean today, feel free to add them to the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll see if we can get around to them in the end. If you're an existing Lightbend subscriber, then you already know that you have unlimited direct access to our expert engineering teams through the customer portal, which is the place you go to ask any and all technical questions, what-ifs, how-tos, best practices, and of course, send your code over. Well, that's all from me. Let's hand it over to Dr. Dean Wampler. Dean, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Oliver. It's good to be here again and uh, talk about an important topic, which is uh, sort of the microservice side of streaming. Uh, let's see, and suddenly my mouth, there we go. So uh, you might recall some of you that I wrote this report a little over a year ago now for O'Reilly that uh, laid out sort of some architectural trends that we're seeing. Uh, in streaming applications. Uh, you, you can actually download this free from our website and uh, uh, we'll tell you more about that a little bit later in the talk. Um, I, it has this diagram which I walk through in, in, in the report and describe all the pieces. I've done webinars about this here in the past. Uh, this year we're actually going to drill into some more details into just a subset of this diagram. So I won't go through the whole thing here today, but certainly you can uh, read about it in the book. Specifically, we're going to talk about uh, using Kafka as your data backplane, but then uh, doing the data processing with Kafka streams and Aka streams. And kind of, as Oliver just said, compare and contrast those two, their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, each of them has, has you know, really nice capabilities, uh, really uh, sort of ideal application scenarios, and uh, try, try to give you a sense of how you pick between them. 
For, first of all, you know, let's talk about why Kafka in the first place. Why is a back plane like Kafka useful? Well, there's a couple of, of advantages. Um, you know, in the worst case scenario, I might have point to point connections between all of my services. I, I deliberately tried to dry, uh, draw a complete you know, bipartite graph here. Um, not only is this ugly, but if uh, let's say service one on the right hand side crashes, then I could have data loss. You know, as all of this data that was going to it is suddenly lost and and I have kind of a messy recovery process. Uh, so one, one of the things Kafka does for you is ar it gives, gives you sort of architectural simplicity and uh, sort of uniformity. Um, basically solving uh, this particular problem with another level of indirection, like we like to do in computer science. But now if service one goes down, the data that it was reading will just be nicely captured in Kafka and ready for its replacement to come up and, and uh, take over where it left off. You know, I can have each topic in Kafka can have multiple producers, multiple consumers, uh, just a lot of nice features. It's just a very good design paradigm. Whether you use Kafka or one of the competitors out there like Pulsar or uh, Provega, uh, you get to get sort of the same basic uh, core benefits from using a tool like Kafka as a, as a data backplane. However, I will talk about some reasons why you might not want to put Kafka in certain parts of your design. We'll get to that a little bit later. So again, we're going to simplify dependencies between services, essentially uh, break the connections so that service one doesn't know have to, have to know about all the services on the left hand of the diagram, for example. You know, much uh, more durability and resilience against failures, uh, you know, lots of flexibility about who talks to whom and so forth. And also, actually, I didn't mention this yet, but if you're just talking uh, through Kafka for everything, that's sort of like one way to do all of your inner process communication. Now, usually one day, one way is never gonna be uh, ideal for all circumstances, but it does kind of simplify your approach rather than having to use ad hoc APIs for, for everything. Uh, for completeness, uh, let me mention two other streaming engines that are part of our fast data platform and contrast why they're very different from uh, Aka streams and Kafka streams, and that is uh, Spark and Flink. Um, the big difference is these are uh, services that you run and then you submit jobs to them and they figure out how to partition. So you get kind of uh, automatic scalability. You get a lot of management of these processes automatically. It, it does take a lot of the load away from you having to figure out how to run all this stuff. You know, once your operations team figures out the right way to run these services, then you as the app developer have a relatively simple and straightforward job ahead of you. So it's very nice for that. However, you know, not every job is going to fit this model. Not, not every job is going to need the kind of scalability that you get from these things. So if you have relatively small data sets, for example, uh, you might have a, a lot of uh, overhead you know, amortized over the amount of data you're processing. So they're not perfect for every scenario. Um, but they are really great for this problem of, I'm gonna take in this data, I need something that figures out how to partition the data to, for scalability, but also knows how to uh, combine steps into the same JVM, so I get efficiencies like that. Uh, this is just a diagram from uh, you know, a typical way that Spark works. Flink works in a very similar way. Um, without going into a lot of details here, just telling you that there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes that you don't have to worry about uh, most of the time anyway. Uh, it just works for you. In contrast, Aka streams and Kafka streams are libraries. That's very crucial. You can kind of embed them in whatever microservice framework you want. They are designed, though, for letting you write microservices that are oriented towards processing data, but have a lot more flexibility in how they're executed, how they're distributed, a lot less overhead than you're running Spark, let's say, uh, uh, for example, uh, when you need small overhead. Uh, but they're designed for smaller scale problems. Um, we'll get into a little bit about scalability as we talk about them in detail. But you know, they're not the sort of things that you would throw at a terabyte scale data problem. Uh, that you're trying to do, like, you know, calculating yesterday's uh, activity overall of Google or something, uh, then, then you'd, you'd probably want something big like Kafka, like, like uh, Spark for that. I think it's also useful to realize that there's kind of a spectrum of microservices. And for our purposes, um, I put this uh, spectrum as event-oriented versus record-oriented. And by records, I really mean things that are kind of anonymous, where I don't need to handle each thing in a custom way 
an, an example of that, an event where I want to do something in a custom way would be like managing a session for an e-commerce store where each piece of data that comes in is going to be something like uh, log in, uh, show me the catalog, uh, add this item to my uh, order, uh, take my credit card and, and process it, uh, ship to this address. You know, those kind of things where each of them is going to be handled at least conceptually one at a time in a very unique way, custom routing, lots of state that's it's being managed in flight. That's sort of the left-hand side of the picture. And that's mostly what we think of when we think of microservices. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, it would be more like, you know, lean and mean processing of data. But, the, you know, a lot of it I can do sort of an aggregate. Like I can take a block of these records and maybe do some common filtering on all of them at once or, uh, turn them from one format into another. I don't necessarily have to look at them individually in any sense. There's obviously a spectrum here, and that's what I tried to uh, show, that you'll certainly have data that's coming into the left-hand side, flowing right into the right-hand side to do other things. And, and similarly, the services provided on the right-hand side might be part of the flow of state that's going on on the left-hand side too. So I don't want to imply that there's a, a clear divide between these guys. Well, it turns out, and this is really useful for thinking about these two tools, Akka emerged out of the left-hand side, really focused on uh, event-driven microservices that are you know, very uh, focused on the reactive uh, principles, you know, availability, scalability, durability, you know, uh, all the kind of things that, uh, that we worry about when we're building long-running uh, services to stay up and stay reliable as much as possible. But Akka Streams, which is a uh, really a stream-oriented domain-specific language on top of the Akka Actor model, kind of pushes the applicability to the right because we typically think of data-centric problems as like a data flow sort of thing. Uh, and Akka Streams makes it much easier for us to write Akka code uh, with that sort of perspective in mind. Uh, in contrast, uh, Kafka really emerged from the right-hand side. I, I don't want to overplay this because certainly people have been using uh, Kafka in combination with uh, the kind of event-driven microservices from the very beginning, you know, LinkedIn and so forth. But, but the way I think about Kafka is it's really oriented towards these, you know, fairly fat data pipes where there's a lot of fl stuff flowing through a system. Uh, a lot of it's being processed as, you know, in sort of these anonymous record-like groups. Some things will be processed on a you know, per item basis, like an event processing system. But kind of the perspective, when I look at these tools, when I look at Kafka and Kafka Streams, I really see that sort of data centricity uh, at the beginning. But once again, people use it for uh, microservices, event-driven microservices in the same way. So let's talk about Kafka Streams in a little bit more detail, and I'll show an example uh, of, of how you might write an application using Kafka Streams. Uh, it's a it's a good low overhead system, you know, on, on a per event basis or per record basis, whatever. You know, there's not a lot of overhead required. Uh, you can get fairly low latency, kind of limited only by the length of your queues in some sense. So if you have a lot of data in the queue and it's processed one record at a time, uh, that's obviously going to impose a little bit of latency there. Uh, the way you do parallelism in Kafka streams is basically, you know, one process per Kafka partition. Uh, the, the topics can be partitioned, and that's the way, uh, the way you scale them out. Um, it is oriented uh, just to reading and writing Kafka topics. If you want to, say, you know, have a REST interface or write to a database, you would use something in, in tandem with this or, you know, some API. Again, this is a library. You know, if your application needs to write state to a database, you just, you know, call that appropriate library separately. Uh, there is a Java API that that's the way it was originally developed. Lightbend actually developed a Scala API for Kafka streams, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but if you look at the code, it kind of looks very similar to what you might be used to with uh, Spark code or Scala collections, you know, where it's a sequence of transformation steps like mapping and filtering and so forth. So it's you know, intuitive in that way if you're used to that model. One of the cool things they added recently is a SQL abstraction, uh, often called KSQL. Uh, I probably should have written KSQL here, but uh, what you do here is you actually run some services, and then you can uh, effectively use a, a console, ter you know, terminal-like interface, CLI, whatever, to uh, write SQL queries. And that's a really nice way to do a lot of these Kafka Streams jobs in a very concise way, 
And it also makes it more accessible to people who are not that you know, technical in terms of programming. And there's also a nice feature uh, called a queryable state. Or, and what it really means is that if I have state in, an Oca, in a Kafka stream while I'm running, I can actually get at it from an external source, like through a REST interface, as if it were a database. So I can uh, interrogate that state without having to, say, have the Kafka stream write to a database, and then I interrogate the database. Really useful feature. So there's a lot of things where it's, uh, they've really done a great job, I think, thinking about the common sorts of scenarios you run into in data processing. Again, going back to that sort of uh, perspective they come from. Uh, if you wanna do things like you know, per record transformations, like you might do in ETL, then you would use the case streams abstraction. But if you wanna do things like aggregations, like I just wanna compute statistics or you know, record the highest value for a key, let's say you're, you're tracking the, the highs and lows of stock prices let's say so every time a new order comes in for let's say apple you just want to remember that and forget all of the other ones you've seen in the past then uh, the k table abstraction is really nice for that other uh, capabilities for doing sql like operations including joins besides just the, the k sql abstraction and they've put a lot of work into what i'm going to call effectively once uh, what the, what i'm really saying here is uh, it, it's, it's called exactly once. This is the sort of a holy grail in, in data processing, but um, it's impossible to actually account for every possible failure. So it's effectively once or exactly once up to, you know, some level of severe failures. And, and, you know, that could be like the entire cluster going down or whatever. So for most practical purposes, it's exactly once. But to be really precise, it's, there are cases where it you could actually have some failure of getting data once and only once. But it, it's a pretty nice feature that you can rely on most of the time. So, uh, you know, I, I had this diagram earlier on the lower right corner of a, sort of a model serving application. And what this would be is, let's say I'm training a machine learning model periodically on the data to keep it up to date. And uh, with whatever the latest model is, I'm gonna do some scoring of the same data as it flows through the system maybe send it downstream for some more processing and so forth. Uh, so in the, then in the bigger diagram, this is how it would look if I was, uh, we're gonna write this with Kafka streams, where now I'll have Kafka topics between all of these major steps. Uh, and what we're gonna do is uh, look at an example that uh, does uh, most of the left-hand side, but, but not really the, the other logic part. And we'll actually use this new uh, uh, Scala API that I mentioned. Uh, here's the GitHub link if you wanna take a look at it. Um, we're actually donating this to Apache Kafka and going through the process of, of starting that now. So this will eventually become part of uh, the Apache distribution for uh, Kafka and Kafka streams. And I wanna credit my colleagues, in particular, Debasij, Boris, and Sean, who worked pretty hard uh, to make this a reality. Uh, the general uh, philosophy of this thing, though, is really not to depart from the semantics of the um, regular Java API, but to try to make it much nicer to work with in, in Scala, such as type inference and, and so forth. But if you know the Java API and you know Scala, then it'll you know, just maps very closely. In fact, we've even turned down pull requests for things that we felt just took us too far afield from the semantics of the underlying Java API. So that's the API that I'll use, and uh, uh, we're gonna walk through this code kind of quickly. There's a lot of details I'm not gonna show you, and I'm gonna gloss over other details. What, what I want you to do, though, is just get a sense of what it's like to, uh, to write a, uh, a job like the one that's shown in the diagram. I, I won't even show you the KSQL interface, but I would encourage you to check that out as well. So the entry point is the streams builder and the convention we use in our Scala API is that we append a capital S to the end of these class names. So that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between our streams builders and the underlying <clears throat> Java streams builder. And this is your entry point. So this is how we're gonna build up these streams. Bottom, a little, um, square red circle of the, the two streams are going up to model serving. That's what we're actually defining here. We're going to assume that both the keys and the values are kind of just arrays of bytes. So we've got to do something to parse those into something useful. 
Uh, and then the last argument that it's sh that's shown for each of these is, is some variable that holds the name of the Kafka topic that we're going to read for this. Uh, this is a helper class. I'm going to use this to hold whatever the current instantiation of my model is and then use that with the next uh, class here that I'm going to call a score to actually score records as they go by. So this is just, you know, an idiomatic uh, choice for this example that I've made. Nothing specific to the APIs, Kafka and Spock and so forth. All right, so th this first uh, sequence of steps will be the, the, the code that reads the, um, uh, the, these arrays of bytes for keys and values, maps over the values, keeping the keys the same, parses those bytes into a set of model parameters, then the next filter step will just keep the ones where that actually succeeded. Uh, you know, the model came out valid in this idiom. Uh, now, what we're doing is ignoring error handling. Like, what would I do if uh, things fail? There's actually a nice feature in Kafka Streams. It's missing in Spark. You can put in a essentially a predicate operator, or a predicate's really the wrong word, but if I have an incoming stream, I can split it into an arbitrary number of output streams using some function that decides how things should be split out. So that's probably what I would insert here in a real application is something that splits the stream into valid and invalid stuff. And I send the invalid stuff down, you know, some error handling path. Uh, the next step is uh, we have our model parameters and this is kind of the abstraction of the model. It might be a JMML uh, kind of model or PMML, sorry, uh, that represents a model that is portable. And now I'm going to instantiate it with whatever I think I want to use. Like let's say a TensorFlow model is going to be built in this step. Uh, and then the, the, the Kafka Streams has this notion of a process. This is kind of like a generic hook for working with the data. It's not actually going to return anything new, so it's a purely side-affecting process in this case, if, if you know what I'm getting at there. Rather than returning a new collection of stuff, I'm just going to handle everything from here on out in kind of an abstract way. And that's what my model processor will, will do for me. Uh, we follow something very similar with the data stream. Uh, once again, parse it into valid records, hopefully. And once we have those records, then the last step is I'm going to uh, call my little scorer object that I created earlier, have it score the record, uh, whatever it is. Maybe it's doing a recommendation. Maybe it's looking for spam, you know, whatever it is I want to do. And I'm going to create a new output record that I call the scored record that'll be the thing that has this... Uh, score value plus the original record, and that will then be written to this output topic. So two topic name is how I'm gonna send it down its way. And that's that scored records uh, topic you can see in the diagram at the bottom right. And then to start it, we, uh, we, we call, we instantiate this Kafka streams object, pass it our builder, pass it a configuration object that I'm not showing you to do things like tell me where the brokers are, and then I just say start, and it's off and running. So, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> getting over a cold, so if I cough, I apologize in advance. So not, the code is not bad, it's pretty concise. Uh, you can quickly learn this API and you can be off and running fairly quickly. Now, obviously I've left out some crucial details like you know managing these models and constructing them and what's scoring all about, but you know, that's kind of a side domain topic from the core domain that we're concerned about, which is how do I build a streaming app with uh, Kafka Streams? So what's missing here? Well, it's an extremely powerful library, but it is the library that you embed in whatever microservice tooling that you're building. So there's a lot of other stuff that you're going to need to provide for, you know, instantiating instances of these microservices, running them and managing them. Um, there is actually some support for this. If you're using the SQL interface, there's services you can run that sort of take off some of that burden for you. Um, but basically, you would embed this code that we just saw in whatever microservice toolkits you want to use. We happen to be very, uh, very fond of our Lightbend Reactive platform. Uh, you could use something else, though, if you really wanted to. And I'll come back and talk about this a little bit more when we talk about Akka. Okay, so let's talk about Akka streams. We'll basically do the same example. Um, but uh, see how it looks in an Aka Streams scenario. Uh, what's the advantages of Aka Streams? Again, very low latency. Uh, the actor model underneath is it can be very, very fast for processing uh, individual records, very efficient. It's not designed for the massive scalability of Spark and um, Flink, as I mentioned. It has a very sophisticated graph API for building up, you know, very non-trivial 
graphs and processing nodes. Uh, you can even have things like feedback loops, which I haven't seen in any of the other toolkits that I've looked at. It is uh, built on top of Aka Actors, so you get all the capabilities underneath, such as you know, sophisticated complex event processing uh, and very efficient processing, as I mentioned. Plus, you get the, the ecosystem that we built around Aka over the years. There's a, a library called Alpaca that gives you connectivity to not only things like Kafka, but also databases, uh, Elasticsearch, and so forth. It's sort of like our version of Camel, if you know that uh, library. Uh, you can run instances of Aka actors across clusters with Aka cluster. There's even a, a, an ability now to run it across data centers. And if you want to persist state, <coughs> excuse me, in your uh, actors, you can uh, use Aka persistence to automatically handle the persistence of state so that you have durability for the data in case you know, something goes wrong. Okay, so in the bottom right corner, I put the diagram that I drew for the Kafka streams example. And here's the uh, larger uh, diagram of how we might do this on Aka. And just for simplicity, I'm going to keep the same framework that I use for model training and storing parameters. The only thing I'm going to change is the bit about model serving and other logic. And just for emphasis, I showed on the right hand side that uh, you, the output of the Kafka stream, uh, the, sorry, the Aka stream um, through Alpaca could go to not only Kafka topics, but uh, any other database or file system that I want. So there's a little bit more flexibility there. Okay, let's get started with this code. You'll see that it's actually a longer listing and I'll, talk, I'll sort of compare and contrast those in a few minutes. Uh, this first bit of code is the way that we set up the Aka system. And one of the things you'll notice is the second line, a materializer. So one of the things Aka Streams does is make a clear distinction between the definition of the stream and how it's actually materialized. The default is to use actors. But in principle, you could uh, implement a materializer for almost any backend, including something like Spark or Apache Beam or something like that, which we're evaluating. Uh, these next two objects are the same ones that we saw before for managing our model and doing scoring. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we're going to set up our stream for processing. Uh, our model data. So consumer is a Aka wrapper around the Kafka consumer API. Notice the method I'm calling at, at most once source. So what we're guaranteeing here is that you will see every event or every record in Kafka at least once. So that means that uh, you'll have to handle deduplication. Uh, we're, we're not trying to solve that problem of, it, of uh, exactly once for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, in print, the Aka philosophy has been uh, oriented towards precision and kind of theoretical accuracy versus you kind of making uh, compromises in some areas for convenience. So this is something that um, uh, you could easily filter out uh, duplicates by just filtering on keys if you wanted. Uh, I'm not showing the model consumer settings. That's the uh, that's an object that tells me where the brokers are, the usual Kafka things. But I am going to read the same topic that I read before for model parameters. Uh, the next four lines are actually very similar to the ones we saw earlier, where first I try to parse these bytes into a model, which is my little class for parameters. And if that succeeds, then I'll uh, convert that into an actual model instance for TensorFlow or whatever. There's a little bit more logic here. This map and get stuff at the end of the two filter lines is uh, just the idiomatic way the API returns objects that are encapsulated and other objects, and I need to pull them out to have what I want. Very similar logic for the data stream. Uh, the main difference here uh, between this uh, logic and the Kafka streams example is I don't have another step at the end for actually doing the scoring and uh, creating a new record type. <coughs> Ugh, excuse me, sorry about the coughing. Instead, I'm going to do this in a slightly different idiomatic Aka streams way, but I could certainly written this the same way as uh, the previous example. Model stage is a class of our own, and what we're going to use this for is to encapsulate the bit of the graph that's going to do this joining of the data stream and scoring it with the model. Um, I'm really leaving out a lot of details here, but uh, you know, it, it sort of looks like this in a sketch. 
there's this notion of inlets and outlets, uh, as, as many as you want, that would be the, the sort of input junctions and the outputs uh, that this little chunk of processing code is going to provide. I've also created a score here. And then I set up handlers for all of the inputs. Uh, I'm not even showing the one for the model input. I'm just going to focus on the data input. So I have a callback that I've defined that um, whenever a new record shows up on um, this input topic connector, then I'll grab it. I'll do the same scoring and creating a new record type that we saw earlier. And then I'll push it at, uh, to, to the output. Actually, I think I missed. No, I guess I have the names right. I thought I had a typo there. So I'll push it out the scoring result of wrapping it in a sum object this is another this is a scala way of indicating when i have something or don't i could push on none if i actually had nothing to send out uh, just to you know complete the processing step and then pull sets me up for the next uh, cycle in this loop there's a lot more details i could show you here but this sort of gives you the gist of how you can write these little reusable subgraph elements and then plug them into a larger graph and as we return to that, uh, there's a little helper method here that's just returning the third of the um, three objects it's passed. And I need that for this graph DSL that I'm going to use. Uh, these first few lines are just setting up um, uh, how I'm going to structure this graph using the objects that I've already built. Um, without going into a lot of detail, let's skip down to the core of this, which is this little bit. You, you can see in the comments here kind of a you know, ASCII diagram of what we're doing. It's very similar to what we have in the diagram uh, that's embedded on the right-hand side of the, the image. We're going to um, mix these two streams together, score inside this model object, which I just showed you, and then output our uh, final records, which include our predictions. And there's this interesting little uh, DSL that they've defined with the tilde right-hand arrow. It's sort of like the function uh, arrow that you can see like in the uh, code just outside of this uh, red circle. Uh, this is the way that we connect subgraphs to each other and build up the final graph. This source shape object, what it's doing actually is we, we have the stuff that's coming out of the uh, model. This is actually pulling the result out of that and then using it as a, a downstream uh, source or output that could be used as an input for something that's uh, whatever we have downstream of this code. And then the last little bit is where we do the final wiring together. We can hook it up to a real source and a real sink. We actually already have it hooked up to sources, which are the Kafka topics. Uh, here I'm showing you how, how you could actually uh, hook up a sort of a no-op sink if you just wanted to ignore the results because, say, you were writing them to a database or something. In our case, we would actually want to hook this up to a Kafka topic. But the point being that there's a lot of flexibility about how you actually wire these reusable subgraph components into real sources and real sinks to create real pipelines. And then we run it when we're done. Uh, one thing too about, the, you'll see in the, uh, the beginning of this little chunk, there's a readable model state store. That's one of our little objects um, that uh, it actually embeds the same capabilities as the queryable state I talked about earlier. We could set up a, a RESTful interface to query the state in this uh, object if we wanted to. I actually left that code off of here for completeness. Um, this code is taken from a tutorial that uh, my colleague Boris Lublinski and I are teaching coming up soon here. I'll have a little bit more information about that tutorial at the end of this uh, presentation. And that's why that's there though, is to enable the same kind of queryable state behavior that is nice in Kafka streams. Okay, let's uh, step back a little bit and talk a little bit more about other concerns for you know, real world microservices. Uh, because we have actors under the hood, it's pretty easy to scale this out. Um, although it, it's, a, it's a more manual process than say the way uh, Flink and Spark will do auto scaling. But if I, if I want to, I could implement this with a lot of stateless workers, you know, let's say the scoring part, and then just use a router pattern to uh, distribute work to them. Um, like I said, I think I alluded to this earlier, if we have state in our actors that we want to make durable in case the actor goes down, we can use the Okta Persistence API. We have Alpaca for connecting to almost anything. And then of course, Lightvin's Enterprise Suite is the production tooling around all this stuff like monitoring and metric collection and stuff like that. 
I want to talk a little bit about a design choice you have to make, and this is the last major topic. When should I actually run data into topics, uh, Kafka topics, and use that as my intermediary versus just doing a direct point-to-point -point, uh, message like I'm showing on the left-hand side? Well, if you're implementing this in Akka, the, the direct connection part is extremely low latency. You know, it's basically microseconds, and it has very minimal I.O. and memory overhead. You're basically putting a message on a little internal message queue inside the target actor. So it's very, very efficient. Plus, because uh, Akka Streams impl implements the reactive stream standard, you get back pressure. So you don't have to worry about overwhelming the queues of these uh, consumer actors because the back pressure mechanism will keep you safe. You do, uh, you can implement uh, multiple producers, multiple consumers, it's, but it's a little bit more of a, uh, uh, a manual process uh, where you have direct connections between them, you know, in the sense that I'm going to send a message to a specific actor, but I can't abstract over the, uh, the address of that actor. So it's not completely hard coded connections, but it's a little less disconnected than the Kafka model that we described. Um, and once again, you can use, you can get durable state with Akka persistence when you need it. I mentioned the last one because one of the benefits of the Kafka approach is that the topics are automatically persisted to disk. So you do get durability automatically just by using Kafka. Uh, you are going to take on higher latency uh, because you're going to be going out of process you know, to something that's managing uh, the broker specifically that's managing these topics. Uh, also, there will be a little latency added from the, the depth of the queue. Although, to be fair, I just mentioned that the uh, Hakka actors also have a very small message buffer, message queue. Uh, in this case, these you do have to be careful about queue depth. That's one of the classic performance issues to watch for in Kafka, is make sure that that doesn't get out of balance. And you will have higher I.O. overhead because you are going across processes, maybe across the cluster. However, back pressure is less of a worry in this case because you effectively have a buffer the size of a, of a disk. Uh, that's the only limitation for Kafka right now is each partition has to fit on a disk. So as long as you're you know, not getting really crazy with the size of these topics, then you're, you're going to be fine for that. And uh, as we discussed earlier, the Kafka naturally very nicely uh, supports this um, sub pub model of multiple consumers, multiple producers that are uh, completely disconnected from each other. So. Anyway, but it mostly boils down to performance trade-offs and uh, a few other benefits. So just to kind of summarize this then, doing direct uh, message messages between Akka actors is ideal when you have pretty small components and the, the amount of data you're exchanging in, let's say, any unit of time is relatively small and not on the order of something where you would be worried about hard disk kind of volumes. You do have to be a little careful that things don't get backed up. Even with back pressure, you still have to be careful that you're at Actors are healthy. That's the usual thing. Um, and you would have to use Akka persistence to maintain a state in a durable way internally. But it is a very performant thing for lots of small, let's call them even like nano services that are communicating with each other very quickly and efficiently. Whereas if I have more coarse grain services on the right hand side, larger volumes of data, a lot more let's say producers and consumers that are uh, you know, going to be writing to these topics, reading these topics and so forth, then uh, you know, having Kafka in the middle is a very good design choice. You do have to be careful with uh, planning your partitioning so that you get the right scalability and use replication for additional durability and all the usual things. But uh, mostly it comes down to sizing is really kind of uh, the issue of whether you would go with the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Well, that's pretty much it. Just a few words about the Lightbin Fast Data Platform. It does provide commercial support for Akka Streams, Kafka Streams, and Kafka. It really tries to give you an integrated platform for <clears throat> the full spectrum of streaming, including Spark and Flink, as well as the full spectrum of microservices. Um, and we also support HDFS, you know, bring your own persistence, whatever databases you need, and then the kind of production tooling that you need to actually run these things. If you want more information about FTP or Fast Data Platform, uh, you can go to this URL, lightbend.com, fast-data-platform. Once again, I encourage you to have a look at my book to really go into a lot more depth than I can here about um, 
these architectures and design choices that uh, were kind of behind the way we built a, a fast data platform. And I'll also encourage you to check out my colleague Boris's book uh, that came out this year, I think it was, on serving machine learning models, uh, where the examples that I talked about really were, kind of, were taken from this, uh, uh, at least one of the techniques that he describes in this book about how do I solve this problem of one system that's doing training incrementally, but another system that's doing scoring? How do I share data? How do I uh, make sure I'm always up to date? The code was taken from a tutorial that Boris wrote, and we're going to co-teach at a few conferences coming up, Software Architecture in New York at the end of the month, Strata San Jose and Strata London over the next few months. And I also have a talk that will be an expanded version of this webinar that I'm doing at Strata San Jose uh, beginning of next month. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, I'd love to hear your questions. All right. Thanks so much, Dean. Well, uh, to our audience, it would appear there is a bit of a zombie apocalypse happening outside my window here. So if you hear uh, sirens and, and so on, don't be alarmed. There's a there's a couple, uh, as, as I'm always surprised to see, Dean, um, there's a lot of questions co coming from folks that are around the same handful of topics. <clears throat> um, so uh, let's actually start with uh, the one that's most relevant to the last handful of slides. Um, a few people asked about uh, resilience, or uh, in this case, durability uh, to mean resilience, I, which I checked into. Um, what, what sort of things uh, do folks need to know when it comes to managing uh, resilience in ACA or uh, ACA and ACA streams compared to Kafka and Kafka streams? Yeah, let me go back to this diagram for a second. <clears throat> um, one of the things you have to think about when you think about resilience is where do I actually need to remember work versus what would be okay to recalculate if I had to. So if you have any of the pipelines we've described, you might decide, you know what, I could rerun this pipeline uh, and not save the intermediate steps as long as I can go back to some safe starting point. Uh, and so that would be the place where you'd want to ensure that you're persisting the data, whether it's uh, in a Kafka topic or if it happens to be some crucial step in an ACA streams pipeline, you might use uh, ACA persistence to uh, remember the same thing or insert a Kafka topic in the middle of your ACA stream. Um, that's the first thing is decide where, where you need to save work versus have to recalculate it. Like, for example, model training is actually fairly expensive. You might decide to be aggressive about saving uh, your model parameters rather than have to go back too far to retrain. Um, so then the, the, the uh, tools you have at your disposal, well, with Kafka topics, they are already persisted to disk. Uh, that's, you know, the, the sort of guarantee when, when uh, Kafka tells you, yes, I've received your message to a producer, it's already persisted it to disk. And if you replicate your partitions, then you have more than one place in your cluster that's holding the data so that you can afford to lose a disk or even a node or whatever. Whereas with uh, ACA, you'd either have to also exploit Kafka for this purpose by you know, having that step where you'd go ahead and uh, write through a Kafka topic or use ACA persistence or some other mechanism to save the state. So uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a design concern. Consideration. Uh, there's a lot of options you can use. Actually, uh, you could, besides the ACA persistence framework, you could do something ad hoc, like just write to a custom thing to a database in your own way. If you have a, a weird way of representing state, that's fine too. Um, but you do get you, you do get some durability already through Kafka topics, and that that's very uh, useful for this problem. All right, thanks for that. Um, this topic actually brought up a, a handful of related questions. So let, let's just go through a couple of those. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, is it possible to use the uh, ACA streams or an ACA actor, for example, to write to a Kafka topic in an automatic way? Or yeah, rather, so I'm sorry, I refra I'm sorry, I, I phrased that a little bit incorrectly, Dean. Um, messages received by a particular actor to be auto-recorded into Kafka topics. Oh, that's a good question. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think that, so the, the ACA persistence mo uh, module is actually an automated mechanism. So as soon as you use it, it automatically persists your uh, messages. I don't think it supports Kafka. So what you would have to do is write a little bit of code. It wouldn't actually be very much because it's, it's a fairly easy thing to implement, but you would have to write a little code that, um, uh, like a little library that you plug in as the first step in the handler for an ACA message that just goes ahead and persists it. But I don't think there's an automated capability built in yet. All righty. Um, there was a question about uh, using ACA streams uh, for queryable state. And is this part of uh, the open source uh, technology or is this uh, something on the side? Right. Um, this is something that uh, uh, it's, it's not as automated uh, or as packaged as the queryable state in Kafka streams, the, the tutorial code that I mentioned. And actually, we're going to open source that, so it'll be available soon online anyway. But, um, uh, and Boris wrote this code. He actually took the facilities already available through uh, Aka HTTP for having a web service interface into your system. And, and I think he's using Aka persistence to make the particular state durable. And then uh, basically Aka HTTP gets a request and it forwards it to the correct act actor to uh, ask for the state and then sends it back. So it's not as nicely packaged as the queryable state in Kafka streams, but it's it's pretty straightforward to implement it and, and the code that we have in this tutorial uh, does that for you. All right, great. Um, let's talk a little bit about Alpaca. Uh, that's definitely something that a lot of our audience is interested in. Um, how does uh, Alpaca help relate to uh, Kafka and Aka with its pre-built connectors? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a community-driven project where people have donated uh, connectors for all kinds of data stores, you know, file systems, databases, um, Elasticsearch, NoSQL, that sort of thing. Um, I think all of them implement the reactive streams protocol. So if you want to talk to Elasticsearch, let's say, and have it as, an, as a source of data into an Aka or Aka streams app, you just use this library, you give it the parameters, and then it will handle back pressure for you internally. Um, so that, that's, that's the model of these things. We're, we're uh, definitely open to more contributions too for people that have their own crazy data store, but it's pretty simple. It's really just that it's, you know, encapsulating the details for the proprietary APIs uh, for each of these tools and then get exposing them in, in a semi or as uniform as possible way to Aka and Aka streams. All right, I'm just looking at the Alpaca page, which can, is continually updated every time I check it. And it looks as though we're up to over 30 different connectors along with a lot of other good stuff for data transformations. So it's wonderful to see that, and I definitely support your call to uh, get more of you folks helping out, uh, helping out uh, the community with Alpaca. Yeah, I um, think one one big one that's missing, I believe, is we don't have an HDFS uh, module yet. So if anybody out there would like to contribute that, it's on my list, but we haven't gotten to it yet. And that will definitely get you a free T-shirt as well. <laughs> um, uh, before before uh, more people have to have to drop off, are the code snippets from this presentation available somewhere? That that was asked a handful of times as well. Uh, yeah, let me let me think about. I actually tweaked them a little bit from the, uh, the the actual tutorial code, so they're they're close to what's in the tutorial. I'll figure out a way to make those uh, those accessible to people. All right, great, thanks, and. Uh, the last uh, question that we have time for today. Um, there's, uh, there's still a little bit of uh, clarity needed around uh, delivery, such as at, what is at most once, at least once, exactly once, and so on. For example, um, you mentioned that uh, deduplication would be necessary for, some of, for one of these. Could you quickly review these again and reiterate the approaches taken by Aka streams and Kafka streams and how these are either good or bad in different scenarios? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so basically, th there are these three models. One would be at least, uh, well, let's say at most once. Let's start with that one. And what that really is, is fire and forget. I'm going to send a message. I have no idea if it actually got there. I don't care. Apparently, they don't care. Um, 
you know, you, you often use this for metrics, let's say, where, you know, if I happen to miss a metric report, that's probably not a big deal as long as the, you know, I don't miss too many of them. Um, but it wouldn't be something you would want to use for like bank transactions where whatever, what most people want ultimately is, is some logical sense of exactly once where if, if somebody debited an account, credited it, whatever, I see exactly those once and only once. So I don't over debit uh, or under debit or, or whatever. So the, the other option, uh, in, and this is actually an order of increasing difficulty too, the other option would be at least once. What that means is, I'm gonna send something, I'm gonna wait for a reply. If I don't get a reply or an acknowledgement, if I don't get an acknowledgement soon enough, I'll go ahead and send it again. And it, what may happen in this scenario is that they were actually sending the acknowledgement, but then I sent the record again. And so they're actually gonna see it twice and then they'll end up acknowledging it twice. That's the easiest of the, th oh, the middle one in terms of difficulty because there's this back channel involved. But then it's up to me on the receiving side to recognize when I've got something twice or to use messages that effectively are um, you know, item potent or if it's like a no op if I get the second message. But normally what people do, and this is what you would do in Akka streams, for example, and this is in fact what they do inside of Kafka streams is they use a, a unique keys to know when a record has been seen more than once and they just throw away the subsequent copies of it. So that's what you would do. That's what Kafka Streams does internally to give you exactly once. Now, the main reason we don't do this for you in, in Akka is we're just a little bit more concerned about people uh, getting comfortable with the idea that they'll never have to worry about data loss or uh, excess copies of records. Yes, that works almost all the time if you follow this mechanism of doing deep duplication yourself or having a wrapper like Kafka Streams is doing that does deduplication. But it's not a 100% a, a guarantee that you'll never have a situation where the, you know, something leaks through. And it's usually involved in more severe failure scenarios where uh, you know, theoretically you can't ever guarantee exactly once, but you can get pretty darn close. So th that's kind of the difference, exactly once being kind of the nirvana, they sort of, uh, I, I can get arbitrarily close to 100%, but I can't actually achieve 100% accuracy. So it's something like uh, zero Kelvin. Kind of, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can get <laughs> arbitrarily close, but uh, never exact. All right. Well, Dean, thank you so much for this uh, enlightening presentation. I know that it was uh, very well attended and you had a lot of very positive feedbacks. So folks, thanks for thanks for saying, being kind to Dean and, and, and myself uh, and very glad to have you join us today. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. If you have found this content valuable and you'd like to actually have a conversation with somebody at Lightbend, you can let us know via the Contact Us tab on our website or you can email me directly at oliver at lightbend.com and I'll do my best to find the right person for you to talk to. So thanks everyone again for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone.